Hi, my name is Robert Boynton. I direct the literary reportage concentration at the NYU Arthur L. Carter Journalism Institute. This is the third and uh, final episode of our reporting on the pandemic series of conversations. And uh, we're very lucky to have today here Amanda Arancha, who is a host and reporter at Planet Money. And she's going to be in a discussion with our very own Ellen Horn, a uh, veteran podcast and audio producer uh, who has a number of new podcasts, one of which is uh, Pandemic Economics on Stitcher, and she'll tell you about some other ones as well. Uh, So we're going to go for about uh, half an hour of conversation, and then um, there's a uh, a chat function, or I'm sorry, Q&A function on your uh, on your on the Zoom webinar. So if you would start whenever you want putting up questions and then that way uh, I can either feed them to Ellen and Amanda or they can answer them directly if they can see them. But at about half half an hour, about 1230, we'll go to your questions and probably talk till about uh, noon, uh, sorry, one or so. So uh, welcome, Amanda. Welcome, Ellen. Great. Thanks. Thanks so much for having us. So um, obviously we're going to talk about um, pandemic and and what we've all been going through here and how that's getting out into the news through Amanda, through Planet Money, and we're especially glad to have Amanda here as our guest to talk about her experience reporting. But man, I just wanted to start in a really different place. So it, by way of introduction to Amanda, um, I wanted to start with a piece that, uh, just a clip from a piece of something that we made together actually about 12 years ago. Um, And I couldn't bring myself to make this a short clip, so this is about a minute, but uh, just to start in a different mood. Oh yeah, oh yeah. No, we we recorded for fifty minutes. Really? (laughs) We just like went for it. And did you laugh? Well, I tried. Rob tried. Mm. Her aunt tried. A laugh, I would almost. (laughs) Yeah, like we we all tried and tried to kind of harass her and like stick your tongue out at her and try to tickle her. And then at the end, she's like, "Ah!" (laughs) (laughs) Lost it. We have yet to get a giggle out of her. That was a smile. What would it take to make you laugh? But it made some sounds we've never, ever heard before. What are all these sounds you're making? Like her level of interaction in the last two days has been more than anything we've seen. Really? Like if you stick your tongue out at her, she does it back. Uh And if you open your mouth, she kind of tries to do that too. It has been a milestone. You know, aside from the, the actual day count, like it really is, she's becoming a little bean. It's, it's much more emotional. It's like you're looking at this thing that you're deeply in love with and it's finally like looking back at you. Well, Amanda, when it happens, will you call us right back? Okay, I will for sure. So not only did Amanda call Jad back and tell him when her baby laughed for the first time for the Radio Lab laughter episode, but she ended up working at Radio Lab as a senior producer and then again as a reporter and producer and spent many years on and off at WNYC before going to Planet Money. Um, Amanda had started first as a sound engineer in Canada before coming to New York and working at uh, this radio show called The Next Big Thing. Now, you, you guys may not have heard of The Next Big Thing, but when I came to New York in 2003, this show was really groundbreaking in making radio that paid attention to sound. And many of its producers have gone on to be just uh, some of the m- most important producers making radio today. So um, Amanda, I have always admired how beautiful and luscious her voice is, how great her ear is. And you may notice that her accent is um, not that of a New Yorker. Do you know any Quebec Christmas songs? Tell me, I'm sorry. Petit Papa Noel. Comment ça va être? Petit Papa Noel. Quand tu descendras du ciel avec des jouets par milliers. Bravo! 
Quand on était tout petit, on a envie de chanter ça avec toi. La première. So Amanda is not Quebecois, but she is from Canada, and uh, she was often sent out on the street to uh, speak French with Christmas tree salesmen and other interesting assignments like that at the next big thing. Um, but also uh, at the next big thing was responsible for some of the sound and the technical side of that show. So Am Amanda is one of those radio producers that really can do everything, has done everything, has had every job that there is in radio. And, um, and I wanted to start our conversation with her um, really in a very specific place five years ago when uh, Amanda was at a meeting at WNYC as she was a reporter at WNYC at this point. And she heard she had a special guest, Zeke Emanuel was there. So and preparing for our conversation today, Amanda and I talked about some of these important moments in her past reporting history. And uh, we kind of narrowed in on this one moment that set the next really several years of her reporting career in motion. And so um, Amanda, what happened in that room with Zeke Emanuel? Um, so by the way, that was the very nice introduction. Thank you so much, Ellen. <laughs> and that, that baby that you heard in that first clip, by the way, is 12 years old behind that door and taller than I am, which is not that hard because I'm five foot two, but still. So anyway, hearing that stuff is really sweet. Thank you. Um, so uh, five years ago at WMYC, I was a health and science reporter. And we did these things called convenings, which was part of a grant, which was you would get together these experts in health and science, and they would all meet together in this room at WMYC. And kind of just talk about what they were interested in. There'd usually be some sort of framework like what's the next thing or what's, you know, one was about New York and I can't remember all of them, but they would do this almost every year. And so Zeke Emanuel came to one, he's an oncologist and he's also a writer and um, kind of thinker on health. And he's also the brother of Rahm Emanuel, who's the mayor of Chicago, if that name sounds familiar. So Zeke Emanuel came to this meeting in 2015 and at the end we were doing a like, well, what should we be worrying about in the future? What should we be thinking about? And he was like, everything you're thinking about, everything is small compared to the fear of pandemics and that there is going to be in a pandemic. It's just a matter of time and you should, he didn't say drop everything, but he was like, this is the thing that matters. And uh, I really heard that and I thought that was really, uh, you know, health and science sometimes is like you're covering healthcare and Medicaid and Medicare and it's kind of wonky. And this was a part of health and science that I learned to love actually from Radiolab and from Jad and from Ellen, which was like kind of these unbelievably huge, all um, encompassing things that made you think about life differently. So that was 2015 and I did a pile of stories since then on pandemics and outbreaks and epidemics and uh, spent a bunch of years not exclusively doing that, but doing that a lot. Yeah. So um, I just wanted to, let's for, um, oh, we've Rob, um, I'd li love to share my screen if you're able to, to enable that for me. Um, but all right, let me try. Sure. In the meantime, let me play another, play another clip. I think one of the interesting things about all of this reporting um, now is sort of looking back on that. This is a, it, it all culminated in a uh, an episode that you guys did for you did for uh, on the media. So I'm gonna I'm just gonna play a, a clip from that. As we shall Oops, see. Sorry, start that at the beginning. Some threats to the American public are overblown, as we shall see. For instance, the Ebola outbreak that ravaged pockets of West Africa and set off a panic when it crossed our borders claimed only a few victims here. On the other hand, sometimes the alarm is all too justified. We are now marking the 100th anniversary of the 1918 flu pandemic which was a global catastrophe, claiming between 50 million and 100 million lives. Scientists are unequivocal. Like a hundred year storm, another pandemic is inevitable. And so in the centenary of the 1918 flu, this week we look at our vulnerability, which depends not only on vaccines and antibiotics and other scientific knowledge, but on politics, messaging, and public trust. 
at a historical moment when no fact is immune from political spin and science itself is under attack. How will medical knowledge, human nature, fake news, dark politics, and the lessons of history converge to determine our fate? So I, I was really struck by how prescient, of course, that sounds now um, in this moment. Of, of course, it sounded a little gimmicky back in back then, like, oh, it's a hundred an year anniversary and, you know, let's, let's look at this big thing, but I'm not sure I took it as seriously. Clearly you did take it very seriously what you were hearing from all of these people. No, you're not. You're yeah, no, I did. I did. And you, it's actually just interesting to hear that clip. I haven't gone back to listen to that episode. And I don't know if you can tell that like clearly on the media helped me rewrite that whole intro. So it sounds like them. It sounds it's very, very much, yeah. What's that? It's very on the media. It's like the very big words and very like you know foreboding sort of introduction. Anyway, it's interesting to hear that because I know I'm like, oh, yeah, I never sound like that. They use so <laughs> many better words than I ever would choose to use. Um, so um, no, it did seem foreboding, but it was very much in the abstract, right? So that's the thing. Like yeah. I had come back to WNYC, uh, like I was working there, and um, at some point. Uh, Welcome Trust, which is like a very large um, foundation that gives out money for health science, was doing a project called Contagious Cities. They wanted WNYC involved. And so um, they were like, do you want to be a part of this thing? And so it was in the abstract, right? It was the pandemic that wasn't happening. And so that was very hard sell in the newsroom, right? Like to be like, this is newsworthy because it's not happening. Um, so I spent a year like talking to people about the coming pandemic and it's not that I didn't, we, everybody knew it was coming. Everybody knew it was coming. Many people thought it was a flu, not a coronavirus, a little different, but they're sort of spread in similar ways. Um, so it, yeah, so it was hard to do as news, but it was easy to like on the media was a better place for it, but it's still everything. So everything that's coming is familiar, but a little bit different too. Yeah. I mean, I, it's very interesting to me that you had, you had spent really what ended up being three years thinking about pandemics, reporting yeah. and talking to experts on this topic. Um, if you guys Google Germ City, there's a WNYC microsite where you can see some of these, um, the, the results of this thread of reporting for uh, for WNYC. Unfortunately, I can't share share my screen, but it's really easy to find, and it's it's some impressive stuff here, um, including this hour that on that on a, on the media. That's really a, a fascinating time capsule to 2018, and, um, and you know, and you wish we had better heeded that warning. Of course, now. One of the things that I thought was really interesting and in going back to review that stuff was this one piece you had made about a uh, a flight. Uh, this is like, this piece is called What SARS Taught Us. Um, so I'm just going to play. Uh, the story opens like this. On the morning of September 5th of this year, a pilot on a 14-hour flight from Dubai to New York called officials at JFK to say, there seem to be a lot of sick people on this plane. Landed at JFK Wednesday morning to a cluster of flashing lights, paramedics, and law enforcement waiting for them on the tarmac. Dozens of emergency vehicles met the plane away from the terminal. The Centers for Disease Control wouldn't let anyone off. And, um, and so... Of course, that is not a flight that happened this year. That was a flight that was in September of 2018. I mean, to tell us how you got from that flight that was grounded at JFK and the CDC stopped to the story of Dr. Leong and SARS. Yeah, so um, how did I get from the one to the other? I mean, that was supposed to, again, like as I said, in the newsroom, sort of being like, it's a hundred year anniversary, or there's this thing that happened five years ago, or like things that aren't actually news are a little bit of a, a struggle. So I think that was supposed to be the newsy top to yeah. a story that I was already working on, which was about SARS, which I found a doctor who um, was patient like two in Singapore. He was an infectious disease doctor. Oh yeah, there's the Germ City uh, website. Um, he was an infectious disease doctor in 
Singapore. I might be mistaken about that. Is that no, right? Yeah. Okay. And he um, had a mysterious saw, patient. say that again? Yes, he had a mysterious, he had a patient. This, this woman had gone shopping in Hong Kong and had come back and was not feeling well. And he was her doctor. And uh, before it was even named SARS, they were like looking at her and trying to figure out what happened. And then he got sick and then he came to New York. So that's the other thing, right? Working in a local newsroom is I needed to have a New York angle. So basically it was this case that came to New York and my question was like, well, did anybody get it? What happened? And so I tracked him down and he was very compelling guy. He'd written about his own personal experience as an infectious disease doctor who contracted SARS. He was flying back from New York, um, feeling very, very, very sick. He hadn't wanted to go, um, he'd gone to a doctor in New York, but he didn't want to be treated in New York because he knew it was going to cost so much money. So after being in New York for a few days, he cut his trip short. He gets on the plane. He's with his wife and his mother-in-law who would come to New York because they wanted to go shopping and hang out. And they're halfway across the Atlantic, getting ready to land in Germany on their way home. And all of a sudden, all of these guys in the hazmat suits that now are sort of familiar, and these were more, even more intense than what we're seeing medical care workers in, but like full on hazmat suits came onto the plane and um, quarantined him at the very back or isolated him and his wife and his mother-in-law at the very back of the plane and moved everybody up with the plane wasn't full. And then they land in Germany and they take him and his family away. And so, you know, it was interesting to look back at SARS um, SARS really had a huge impact on the airline industry, but because it never really played out in New York or in the US, I don't think people thought that hard about it here or learned that much. So you hear now that all these countries were better prepared because of SARS. Um, and because I'm from Toronto originally, of course, I had a brother-in-law who thought he had it and was isolated. So Canadians had a little more sense of it. Um, but it was interesting to go back to that moment and also to discover that SARS just was not as contagious as what we're facing right now. Like it, uh, he didn't get anybody else sick. He got his mother-in-law sick and he got his wife sick, but he, nobody else in New York City appeared to catch it from him. Yeah, I mean, the lead of that story, you sort of take these media reports of like, what an atrocity, these people were inconvenienced on the runway, like as though this, this, the flight being stopped on the runway and the CDC holding it, um, you know, how it was playing out in the media. Uh, was a sort of misunderstanding in that, and, if, and your treatment of it is, is like, this is actually quite serious. We should all be very alarmed. The, let me play the, the kicker here in the, at the end of the story. SARS revealed the ways in which airlines and public health officials were not ready for a global pandemic. So much has changed since. There are now international health regulations and greater surveillance because... The biggest culprit of future viral infections is going to be human. It's going to be air travel. I mean, it just sounded so eerie to me today because it does feel like, I mean, I, I just heard that, that JetBlue just started requiring people to wear face coverings like in day 50 of, of all of this. Um, you know, that's, that's less a comment on, on reporting and journalism here than the, the current moment that we're, we're in. But one of the things that I'm, I'm, uh, hearing from you as you talk about these stories and the way that you cover it is how much the outlet, the, the place that you're putting the story out changes the lens and the need, you know, whether it's on the media and the, and the way that they're influencing the way you're writing your narration or the newsroom and the hooks you have to find for it to work in the newsroom. You've certainly been through a lot of different places and and been uh, and learned a lot of ways to make your stories um, work in response to the needs of each specific newsroom. I, I want to transition to another one of these amazing uh, pandemic germ um, stories that uh, came out of that thread of reporting. Um, flu done it. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> the yeah, clip I have. It from flu done it is really the reveal. So I'm hoping you can just sort of tell us how that came about, how, um, what the setup at the needs were of that kind of story and um, what sort of creativity you were able to bring to it and all of that. It's really so amazing. yeah, so flu done it was one of my favorite things. It's very silly. So it's a little hard to listen to now because it's, we're in such a different moment, but um, 
So I was working in the newsroom and also, no, I guess I was on the health desk and we were putting out a regular show called Only Human. So we sat in the newsroom. So we had this weird relationship, newsroom and a show podcast, uh, which was a science and health show. And uh, I worked with this woman named Elaine Chen, who is now at the New York Times. And she um, had been approached by these researchers at NYU and at, sort of at Columbia, who were doing a project called uh, Go Viral. And what it was, was like, it's a bit like the Seattle flu study, which you might've read about in the news lately. It was like a flu study that where people would swab their noses and they were gonna try to track the flu in different cities across, I think they were doing New York, I think they were doing a bunch of cities. And so Go Viral had approached Elaine and then we were trying to figure out like, we were doing a bunch of citizen science stuff at the time, like kind of these fun little, funny little experiments with the team and with our show. Um, and that was part of our mandate also was to do audience engagement. So um, we were like, okay, what are we going to do with this study? We'd like to work with them. And then I don't remember whose idea it was. I, I don't think I can take credit, but we were like, okay, what we'll do is we will do a flu study of a closed environment, which is like a, a bunch of office workers and their homes. So I think there were about 16 to 18 of us. And over the course of 10 or 12 weeks, we would all swab our noses send the swabs to Columbia to a guy named Professor Jeffrey Shaman, who is also in the news all the time now because he's a famous and um, flu um, forecaster. Um, and we would also fill in these daily reports about like, how are we feeling so that they, there could be some sort of match between like the actual sort of um, looking at our swabs and also like, how are we feeling? And we recorded the whole thing. So this is one of these process stories where you like just record everything. Oh yeah, there it is, flu done it. Um, and uh, I, I did you anyway? I'll, I did, I spent like a long time in in uh, um, Photoshop making a little image where instead of clue it said flu. <laughs> I thought that was hilarious. Anyway, it's not very well good use of my time. But anyway, so we did this. So we recorded the whole thing. We recorded the researcher from NYU approaching us. We recorded ourselves swabbing our noses. We recorded. Um, like everybody recorded at home too, because that was part of the question was like, um, how would it spread in our homes? And uh, the question at the heart of it was, well, who came to work sick? Because somebody, when you're sick, as Kenny Malone, my co-host on, or like my co-host at Planet Money, who he and I worked together then, he was the kind of guy who's like, would get sick and would stay home. and was like, you shouldn't go to work sick. And Elaine, for example, was the total extreme and she would always show up sick. And uh, so we were like, okay, there's a mystery. Some people are feeling sick. Who brought it to work and should have stayed home? That was the <laughs> setup. And this is the reveal. This is like the crappiest Oscar awards ever. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Elaine. You're welcome. Over the past few months, there have been a lot of accusations. There have been suspicions. There has been blame. And there has been guilt. <laughs> they we have the results. There were two people in this experiment who were- In the end, we did not get the flu once. We did get lots of colds though. Of the 20 people participating, the six coworkers plus our family and friends at home, we got 13 cases of rhinovirus, five cases of coronavirus, four cases of adenovirus, and two cases of RSVB, which is another respiratory illness. All different kinds of colds. The researchers said that this was pretty much what they would expect. And we appear to have suffered from two rounds of work-related illnesses, meaning we probably got each other sick. And there was one person who had it first. I'm scared. So the perpetrator, the person who got three people sick at the very beginning when we started Flu Done It, Jillian Weinberger. Wow. Boom. Wow. <laughs> Kenny, it was right all along. It was Jillian. The lab results showed that three people tested positive for the same virus, a rhinovirus. And the symptom reports revealed that Jillian felt it first. So, um, that's very uh, funny to hear that. What I love about this piece is how you build the, the work dynamics of these characters and you create this sort of suspense through the story. Um, but it, and it's all totally relatable. Like we all we all know the people who always come to work when they're sick and who you know don't show up and bail when they have the tiniest sniffle and you know leave you holding the ball because they can't come to work because they're sick. Um, it, you know, I agree. It does sound uh, in this circumstance now 
like the levity of all of this is a little hard to hard to listen to um but there's a really important piece behind all of this which is about that contact tracing component and and that element of your reporting led you to a really interesting place which um you were telling me about about some of the opportunities on you know which unfortunately you did not get to to fulfill but you had gotten interested in contact tracing and uh spoke with lots of people about the importance of that can you just tell us a little bit more about um what some of your ideas were Sure. Um, so I, uh, in that bigger project, Germ City, one of the things that I proposed was that we build an app for the station for WMYC and uh, that it would be, a, it's, it's, it's a contact tracing. It wasn't the term that people were using, contact tracing, but um, that's, it's, that's what it was. There had been a TV show at the BBC called Pandemic and in 2016 or 2017, and they had built this app and they had, um, it was kind of, it's kind of what you're hearing about right now. It's like you put it on your phone and you leave your, um, I forget exactly how you would leave it open, but you basically leave it open so that if other people contacted you, your phones would sort of meet. And so it would be like, okay, well, who did you, how many people did you run into on the train? How many people did you run into in the, in the shop? How many people did you run into in all these different places? And it would keep track of your data. And same thing like what we had done with Flu Dundit, I think there were some symptom reports being done as well. And they turned this into this TV show and they built this app for it. And I was like, oh my God, I wanna do that. That looks so fun. So I was in touch with the, the mathematicians who had been behind the app and I was in touch with the TV show and the BBC and everybody was game. Like we were gonna build it for New York City um, and for WNYC. And we got, I got pretty far. I got pretty far, like the people who do product design at WMYC, which is like a thing now that exists sometimes at news organizations. And by product, they mean like apps and platforms and various things that are not audio content. And they were into it. And it was just, a, it, my timing was off. Like, again, as I said, it wasn't a pandemic. So there was no justifiable reason in that moment. And I think it was right before the midterms that I had pr proposed it. So I think just the newsroom was taxed. And so we, we couldn't do it, but I went back to look at my like plan of it. And it was cool. It's too, it is a little too bad we didn't do it because we could have revived it in this moment. And that would have been an interesting thing to do. Yeah. Yeah, completely. Yeah. Um, so, so then it, at some point uh, in the past, six months you you left WNYC and you went to go work for Planet Money. Um, how has your background in health reporting and in this kind of um, really sound rich and story focused reporting, how has that played out in, in at Planet Money? Um, I Talk. wish I could be more useful. Like I, if I would have been very useful to be on a local science and health desk for sure. Cause I could, I had all this big Rolodex and I'd done all these things that I could have revisited. So I'm, I'm pretty new to planet money. And I think, um, you will discover as freelancers or as people who get on staff at different organizations that like, you can take in all the content from that place and have a sense of what, um, an editorial vision is, but it's very different on the inside. There's all of these like um, expectations and there's like all of these like, oh, we would never do a story on X. Like, like I discovered at Planet Money, like they're like Etsy. We wouldn't do a story about Etsy. Like, I, I don't know, just these things, each, each show or like paper or whatever has like an identity. And so uh, I'm just very new to it. So I haven't really cracked the show yet. I haven't quite figured out how they make what they make. I'm making content but I'm, I'm still figuring it out a bit. They don't do a ton of health. They don't do a ton of science, right? It's a show about economics. So the ways I have been trying to be helpful is I've been in on most of the science and healthy stuff that we have done as kind of fact check. Um, so I, I did a story with Sarah Gonzalez about vaccines. That was really her story. She had spent a couple of weeks on it and she got, she interviewed the guy who runs who ran BARDA, which is the biomedical research uh, arm of the government that is leading kind of the vaccine stuff. And he was recently uh, dismissed. Um, so she oh, did wow. a great interview with him and she and I are in that episode together. And a lot of what I did was like, uh, you know, sort of fact check and like, that's not quite right. And, you know, just fixing stuff and um, clarifying things. Um, and then what else have I been doing? Yeah, oh, I guess I did. I went, I revisited one science, one other science health thing, which was um, I had long been sort of interested in Bellevue. You guys probably know Bellevue Hospital. It's kind of an amazing, bizarre place. 
Uh, it's the oldest public, it's believed to be the oldest public hospital in the country. Um, and they have a, um, it's a public hospital, so you don't need insurance. So in New York, if you don't have insurance, and if you're undocumented, they have three uns, undomiciled, undocumented, and uninsured. Wow. Go to Bellevue. And Bellevue is also the place where um, when we had an Ebola patient in New York, he went to Bellevue. And so I had gone in 20, I think again in 2018, to watch all the people at Bellevue prepare for the next pandemic. I was actually there for a training where they were preparing for a coronavirus. So wow. um, you guys probably know this by now, but the coronavirus is also just a cold. Like it's not necessarily as deadly as what we're experiencing right now, but it was, SARS was a coronavirus, MERS was a coronavirus, this is a coronavirus, and also there's a coronavirus that just gives you like the sniffles. Um, so they were preparing for a deadly coronavirus outbreak. And so they were doing the PPE and the gloves and the masks and the whatever. So I really wanted to revisit that. I couldn't use my archival as much as I wanted to just because Planet Money isn't really that kind of show. And what we ended up doing it about was, here's the super old hospital. They have um, X number of hospital beds. It turns out they have way less hospital beds than they had in 1918, which is kind of like the people I work with were like, that is unbelievable. And so we took an economics lens on that story and we're like, well, why do hospitals now have so few hospital beds? That was uh, kind of the take on it. Yeah. Do you want me to play the, play the clip on that? Oh, sure. Yes. So this is a nurse. Uh, I got to talk. I didn't get to, I didn't go into the hospital. I don't think anybody would have wanted that, but I did get to talk to a nurse there, a woman who ran nursing for the emergency room. We're trying to help our sister facilities that have been hit harder. Are they starting to send patients to you guys? Yes, yes. Uh -huh. Wow, so it's really, there's a lot of complicated logistics going on. <coughs> yes. <coughs> so, you okay? Uh, yeah, yeah. That's just like dry throat. You can't even cough anymore, Amanda, without people looking at you. I know. So, I'm also, um, but it's, it is when people, I've been talking to a number of people and every time they cough, I'm like, oh, I mean, and you're a nurse, so that's even more worrying. I know, I know, I know. It is worrying. It was so worrying. I mean, Bellevue is a very hard place to get to talk to you, as if anyone has ever done this kind of reporting where you talk to hospitals, like so many rules. Um, so I'm hoping I can check back in with her and see how she's doing at some point. We'll see. Yeah. Um, um, we, we have a few questions, maybe we can start. Oh, yeah, yeah. One question, Maria Abreu says, uh, asked, uh, as journalism students trying to break through the industry during this time, should we focus on covering the pandemic or should we try to cover other topics to stand out? As journalists starting, I mean, now this is as students, so this is like the kind of work that you're making right now for school. This isn't stuff you're trying to sell. Um, well, I guess that's probably, I mean, you, know, both, I, right? you could even, you could double service it, you know. I mean, that's a very good question. I think the question about the public's appetite for, uh, for information about um, this pandemic is un a little unpredictable, right? I'm sure you know people who are like, I can't take it anymore. I can't listen. I can't engage. And then I'm sure you know people who all they can engage with is what's happening. I guess what I would say, I, I, so I don't think there's a right answer, unfortunately. I know that's sort of like, um, that's not very nice to punt it. I kind of think reporting on the moment, you m might as well. I think it's a, such a, it's like when you go and look at the old outbreaks in the old pandemics, like from 1918 to Ebola to AIDS to all of these things, it's, you look back and you, you get less than you would think you would. Like there's less, um, archival material, there's less audio, there's less video, there's less photos, there's less everything. I'm always struck by that. Even 9-11, when we went back, you know, 10 years later when we had to do the anniversary stuff, we were kind of like, it's just less. You thought there'd be all these things, but almost everybody gets rid of their raw tape. Mm -hmm. You know, they don't keep their notes. Like, so I, even as a moment of documenting, I actually think it's really interesting to do stories about what's happening and also like the extent to which we're all so, we're all part of this story, you know. I get personally a little fatigued by the like, it's pandemic plus X, like pandemic plus, I don't know, cats, pandemic, but like there's a bit of the like, we're trying to make this topic fit in every, every bucket. 
but I think I, I think it's important to document and I think there's still lots of stories to tell and it's such a fast moving story like from one week to the next it's so different that um I, you know you have assignments from your teachers but I, I do kind of encourage you to like take a moment and really try to document this time I think I'm glad you mentioned that the documentary aspect of it because we sometimes forget uh, that you know simply documenting or simply is even the wrong word documenting events like this in the most sort of aesthetically pleasing beautifully journalist journalistically smart way I mean I teach you know Jacob Reese what was Jacob Reese doing other than documenting poverty he in, in in doing so created an incredible body of photographic and also written work but his his, his instinct was to document and, and I think that is an important thing to do now also because I think a lot of this work that you do now without maybe knowing exactly what it would be for will come in handy later on and um, can be developed and especially if you're interested in like students of mine long form I mean the interview you do with the the ambulance driver today in six months or a year might be very valuable when something happens to him or the hospital or something like that. And we always have to be thinking ahead. Another question is um, if we want to do a story about how minority immigrant communities are affected by the virus in New York, how do we look for sources given that we have to quarantine? This is sort of the essential question of this yeah and i mean um i i think almost everyone is doing their work from home like at npr we're going out a little bit i'm going out today but it's only my second time out i you don't have to go out i think i don't know what nyu's policy is on it um but everybody's available by phone right now right like um you, I, I realize that there's a tricky, there's a slightly tricky thing, which is you're asking to maybe access a community that is a little harder to access, but definitely like a lot of the nonprofit organizations that are, you know, were there before, are there now, um, and so they're they're there, and they'll 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 be able to put you in touch with people. All of the the, um, like sometimes I teach at CUNY, and so sometimes I'll like use the CUNY resources for like immigrant students or undocumented students or um, there, there's organizations within your school, there's organizations within the city that they're always, those are good places to start. Um, and then also like people who are, there's often people in different communities, even really tight, small ones that you don't necessarily have access to. Almost all of those communities have somebody who acts as a bridge, right? Like people, you know, the kids of immigrants who speak the language of their parents and also speak English or um, Spanish. So I, I don't think it's inaccessible and because cell phones are so private, kind of almost everybody has a cell phone. We live in a country where almost everybody has a cell phone. You can be making calls. We're doing a lot of reporting via like FaceTime and WhatsApp. And uh, we're in some weird way, you actually can get into places that you couldn't get into before because there's, we're, we all know that people's audio recording or, or things are being done remotely. So there's a little bit of an acceptance of lower audio, qual lower quality. Um, so we're, you know, but we'll ask people to take their, their FaceTime and like walk around and show us things and be in places that we would never be able to be in. So, so this is a good, a good time to ask questions. A number of you have sent them. Please, I encourage you, anyone who's, uh, who has questions about anything having to do with reporting and audio uh, and the pandemic uh, to send them to me now so I can pose them. Um, the question I have for you is what are you working on right now? Yes, so I am going, I can show you here. Show us your boom. What's that? Oh, show, show, show you the boom. So that's all my gear. When we hang up at one, I'm getting, I have a car. So that is definitely an advantage. As I said, this is my second time leaving um, my house for um, remote recording. So I have a boom pole. With, this is actually a very fancy boom pole. My, it was my husband's. He was a sound engineer for many years. It's got velvet on it, so that'll be nice. I have... Um, I've been told by NPR's got all these rules, and so I've been told to bring as little gear as possible. So I'm bringing, I have to use the boom pole with the mic. I have a mic for myself. I have a couple masks. I have, actually, this is sort of interesting. I have the um, Department of Homeland Security essential workers list. So this is like, if somebody were to stop me, which is apparently not really happening, but if I were to be stopped, I have a press pass. I have this list that says media people are essential workers. Wow. Um, yeah, I had to go on, I had to have a phone call with the person at NPR who like, um, sends people to war zones, which is sort of crazy. And she was like, yeah, make sure you, you know, uh, what's that? 
it's a security officer at NPR? Uh, she's not, I don't quite, I forget what her title is. Like she's, she just like manages like all of our, like, like, um, like when there's training to go to a war zone, she's like the manager of all that stuff. Um, so it's not a war zone, obviously, but they're sort of, they're taking it very seriously. Um, so I had to talk to her. She doesn't want me to go in to the place I'm going to. I'm going to a Chinese restaurant today. Um, and we're talking about, uh, how they, um, because it's a Chinese restaurant, because actually the people who own it are originally from China, they have lots of contacts in China. And so they keep finding out what is happening two or three weeks in advance or months in advance a little bit sometimes. And so they're, they're preparing their restaurant, um, according to advice from their friends back home. So they've adapted and changed their business. So it's a, as a Planet Money, so it's a business. That can the NPR be security person doesn't want you to go into a Chinese restaurant? I mean, she's, it's okay. It's, the restaurant is closed, right? There's no like, I mean, it's closed for patrons, but right. they're doing deliveries. For all restaurants, right. Yes. So, I'm, so we debated like, could I just stand outside? And uh, it's not because it's a Chinese restaurant, it's because it's an indoor space. So we talked a lot about how the space was set up. And by the end of our conversation, she was like, that sounds safe. It sounds like there's very few people in there. Everything's hard plastic. She's like, that's, you know, the, the virus will sit on hard plastic for longer, but it's also easier to clean. So she uh, also, she also put in an order for mushu pork. Uh, just I mean, I am definitely planning to leave with some food. So there, I, I know this restaurant because I like their food so much. So it's probably why I'm going. Um, Another question that came through is, how do you manage your stress while reporting on such an overwhelmingly and constantly changing topic like the pandemic? I like to work a lot. So I, I feel like working gives you like uh, a thing to put all your energy in. It's when you're not working that it feels a little more stressful. Um, Sorry, Ellen, I, I didn't mean to interrupt you. You, you had a question. Yeah, I don't know. How is anybody managing the stress? We go, I have kids every week we get in our little car and we drive to something that's more woodsy. I live near Prospect Park. I try to bike every day. I, yeah, I don't know. I don't think I'm doing anything different or better than anybody else. I, I was going to ask Amanda, you know, obviously reporting um, is different. You usually wouldn't make a phone call to someone at NPR to walk through your technical reporting plan with them before you go out into the field. How else have things changed at Planet Money um, and in terms of editorial meetings, in terms of how you communicate with each other, in terms of how you do edits, like the, those sorts of things? Um, I think there's a sense that the bar is lower and that people need things fast. So everything's a little bit, the, everything's a little bit, um, we were putting out three episodes or four episodes a week for a little while there, we usually do two. So there's a sense of speed, urgency. Um, we have a meeting every morning at 10 where we talk about what we're doing that day, which is sort of actually feels like more of an emotional thing than a necessity thing. Like it's good to see people, right? Um, but everything is more complicated and more challenging. We, there's a very collaborative approach at Planet Money for edits. Um, so you are often, on your own, maybe writing your script, almost all, every episode has a co-host, so you might be working with that person. Um, and then now, just instead of going into a meeting room, we all meet in this box to talk about our episodes. We play audio through it, like Ellen has been doing. Um, the edits don't feel that different. It doesn't feel that different. Getting used to this a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and and then in, in terms of working with outsiders, with freelancers, are, are you able to tell whether there's uh, a difference on that front right now? Yeah, that Planet Money actually generally likes freelancers and um, non-Planet Money people because we put out a lot of content. And so sometimes we can't do enterprising reporting as much as we would like. So we'll often collaborate with people outside who might be on a story for much longer than we get to be. Um, but right now, I think because of all the logistics, um, we, that ha it hasn't, it, it basically hasn't come up, but the team has been making stuff and we haven't really gotten pitches. Maybe we maybe got one pitch from the outside. Um, so it's not that it's not happening. It just hasn't been happening. I think we have another question. Um, 
from Eleanor. It's following up on an immigrant patient's troubled, she's following up on an immigrant patient's troubled experience getting treatment in hospitals in New York for COVID-19. How can she report and utilize the resources the best, utilize mm. resources when she can't physically be there and has limited knowledge of how New York hospitals operate during this pandemic? Yeah, I mean, hospitals, as I said, it's very, very tough. It sounds like you might already have the patient. So you've already kind of crossed the big hurdle. Like usually when you're doing science health reporting, you're calling the hospital to ask them to give you a patient. Um, and there's all these HIPAA rules about what the hospital can say and what um, they're not supposed to, and what doctors can say about their patients and nurses can say about their patients. So that, it sounds like you already have the person. Um, and you will not be able to get in the hospital, obviously, nor do you necessarily want to go in. That's a very unsafe place to be. And I think that, I think you just have to utilize the phone. I mean, that seems to be all of the, I'm not doing health science now, so I can't totally tell you about all the stuff that I read and consume. They're accessing people by phone. They're accessing the families by phone. You can try, I mean, you can try to call the hospital. I don't think that's going to get you very far. You can try to go through the press department of the hospital. Um, I'm just, I'm reading your thing again here. Um, I think your best bet is the patient's family, right? The, the patient's family, the patient's community, the people outside. I don't think you're really gonna have any other way of getting to that person through the hospital. I well, hope that's a little helpful. Let me ask you a question, uh, sort of put on your press critic hat. Yeah. Uh, you talked about the 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 sort of dearth of, uh, of material, even something as, as enormous as 9-11. Uh, this certainly is as disruptive as, as 9-11 uh, in, in real human terms. Um, how do you think the coverage has been so far in terms of the photography, the print journalism, the audio? Uh, do you see any aspects that are lacking, that are overdone, that are underdone? Um, I'm not asking you to slag on your colleagues, but you know, could you speak about sort of how you see it as a consumer of media? Yeah, right. Um, I'm not at fatigue yet, but I'm maybe getting a little close. It was so fast changing at the beginning. So you needed to consume it to be able to understand. And now there's a little bit of a, things are a little less surprising and changing. Um, I guess, I mean, I feel grateful to be at Planet Money because I do feel like the economics thing is just going to become a thing that's just going to keep going and is not going to be just about testing, just about contact tracing, just about uh, hospitals. Um, I'm trying to think what I've been consuming. I'm definitely very impressed by the very creative uses of media, like, like we're all limited. So um, did you guys see that Dow and the Get Down? She's a band, like it's a band, and they made this video together all in isolation. Did you guys see this? I don't know. Ellen's nodding. Ellen's yeah, the kind of you consume. Yes. I'm, I'm working on a project with her right now. Yeah. Really? Yeah. yeah, she's cool. She's super cool. And so they made a video in Zoom, and you can see all the ways that the um all the different squares are like working together and stuff. Those things are really cool. I'm watching Saturday Night Live uh because it's so interesting to see how they pull it off. I watched Colbert the other night, which was he's weirdly good by himself. <laughs> like, oh my god you like he's so good he's such a yeah. pro it's not really media i guess kind of media um and he's telling the story to his his wife wanders in and his son sits there and that's who his audience is but his his pace is still perfect um i'm reading the new yorker the new yorker is a little challenging because especially if you get the magazine it feels old by the time you get there i'm reading a lot of gothamist because it's so they're so on the city and they're so up to date um Gothamist has been great. Um, I can't listen to podcasts anymore. I don't know about you guys. I only listen to Planet Money now because I've lost my two hour commute. So my podcasting, listening, I'm one of those people that has done that I have, because I also have kids and it's super weird to wander around the house with your headphones on. Right. Um, podcast. I was just reading podcasts. Listening has dipped a bit, but, yeah. then, and, but then home listening and various devices has started to pick up. Yes, and you're right. And the trouble with kids is like you, you don't want to play content that you have to answer a lot of questions about. So I, you know, we don't want it super grim in here. So I, I'm personally not listening that much. I mean, I have been in Planet Money's been putting out great stuff. I guess I'm only listening to Planet Money, so I can't tell you what else. <laughs> I listen to WOYC too. Um, it's hard. It's a hard story, right? Like it's, um, it's impacting everyone, but there's also the risk of fatigue and like how do you still bring people a little bit of hope in this very sad moment? 
I do. I was just doing some quick Googling while you were talking about the percentage of healthcare of the U.S. economy, which is, depending how you measure it, is anywhere between, you know, 10 and 20 percent gargantuan. And uh, so, uh, the, and the, the economic stories that, that I was reading and sort of uh, losing patience with were much more uh, purely business stories. You know, how, when will the market recover? What kind of recovery will it be? And sort of my pet peeve is that, that the, the human dimension, and I don't just think human interest stories, but uh, I was just reading this morning about a Facebook group in, you know, in uh, upper New York state where every single person there said, I don't know anyone who's had this virus or I don't even know anyone who knows anyone and intimating that perhaps it's really being overblown. And I, I do worry that, that there are large swaths of the country which are relatively untouched who have had no, uh, haven't seen photographs, haven't seen video, haven't seen anything. They just read these statistics and they hear Trump raving about whatever he's raving about. And I do wonder about the, about whether the media are doing enough to sort of give us that subjective uh, take. I mean, the, the the diary by that doctor that was in the Times Magazine two weeks ago, I thought spoke volumes in that direction. And I, I wonder whether with the omnipresence of uh, cell phones and voice memo capacity and stuff, we're not doing enough to uh, to, to really to dig into the uh, the intimate experience of this. I think that's fair. I think that's fair. I mean, we really struggle by all being in New York, right? We're having such a different experience of it than everywhere else. So, I mean, I, what I hear you saying, um, Robert, a bit is like, other people in other places don't get it. And I think there's the same sense that they feel like we don't get it. Like we're, you know, I'm supposed to go to two memorials today. Like it's different in New York, right? It's different in New York. Uh, like virtual memorials, I'm not going out, but the, um, sure, sure. it's a very different experience here. Like I, I, I don't, I, everyone I know has it. Like our neighbors all had it, my brother-in-law, everybody has it. So I, I almost have the opposite worry, which is like, we, f we worry, we fear that we're covering it in a way that the rest of the country can't really relate to, or some of the country, not all of it. That's um, funny. And I have, I mean, you, and I live, you and I live probably two miles apart, but I have the opposite experience. Other than hearing sirens all the time, and when I go running every day, I run by a hospital that has huge, you know, freezer truck outside. Uh, I know one person who had a mild case of it. I, I have no connection to it at all. And where That's I interesting. curatorially minded, I might think, Jesus, why am I being kept inside all the time? Ellen, you were going to say something. I'm sorry to interrupt you. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I'm more on Amanda's end of the of the spectrum for the record there. But um, but Amanda, you were telling me that the, an, another parallel might be 9-11 and your experience in working on the next big thing and talking to stations around the country with 9-11. Um, you know, yeah, that you want to relay that story? Sure. So this was many, many years ago back. I got my job at WMYC right after 9-11. So in like November 2001. And so this was uh, that show that Ellen mentioned before. Um, and I had this weird part of my job, even though I was like doing technical stuff, you know, uh, like sometimes you do a lot of different jobs. And one of my jobs was to like talk to the stations that carried our show. And I remember talking to someone in Mississippi and him being like, by, this was like maybe January. He's like, I'm very sad for all of you about what happened with 9-11, but how long are you guys gonna just make content about just 9-11? Like, you know, he was very gracious about it. And it was true, like everyone I worked with was like um, PTSD, you know, like they, they couldn't make other content. Um, and I worry a little bit about having so many media makers in New York City not understanding what is happening elsewhere. And maybe, Robert, you're right, like, we need to communicate how it is here so that it isn't like here in other places. But maybe it never will be like, it probably will never be like it is here in other places. So it's, it's, a, it's a very tricky balance of trying to serve audiences and, and try to anticipate what they, what they want. I just have a pet peeve about, about HIPAA and the way that that you know, upper middle class people conserve and protect their privacy, whereas we have no compunction at all about you know when uh, Ebola breaks out in Africa, you know, going there and taking photos and sticking mics in people's faces and seeing dead, dead bodies all over the place. I mean, that's never a problem as long as they're black and brown. But you know, when it's here and it's a much more mixed crew, then everything we're very very sensitive and and something just strikes me as not right as much as I do understand that the virtues of those those privacy laws. Yeah, that's interesting. That's interesting. Well, I definitely, I saw that one photo. Was it Newsday? Who did it? Where it was like in one of the hospitals in Queens and you could see 
Is it AP? Do you guys know what I'm talking about? There's a man lying on a gurney and he's very exposed. He's barely wearing like, so he's sort of got underpants and a little sheet over him. And he's, uh, he's uh, I'm not sure what ethnicity, but he was not a white. Uh, mm -hmm. And it was really invasive. I don't quite know how that happened. Um, yeah, I, I mean, one, the one um, uh, thing I think back about from that on the media hour we did about was the way the country responded to Ebola, the way differently than what they're responding to now. I mean, both are tinged with a lot of racism um, and the Ebola one was really intense. Uh, so even to go back, just the fear of other people and other countries and um, and how that was used for political gain. And, you know, we're doing that now. I, it is less than Ebola, I think, but it's it's clearly um, um, the racism towards China right now is, is worrying. Yeah. I didn't really answer your question. It wasn't really, I mean, but I was sort of talking about it. It's not really a question, but I, I hear you yeah. that uh, it's different when it impacts more people. It's being treated differently. So if there's any last questions, I think we are almost at, a, at our end time here. Um, uh, Amanda, you've been teaching for many years, and, and I just wanted to ask, as, as we wrap up, um, learning how to report under these circumstances, do you think it's any different? And do you have any advice to students in this moment, especially students who might be entering the, the job-seeking world or students who are working on their, their craft in this moment, beyond document the moment? Yeah, I mean, it's, I, 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 I empathize. I think this is, or I sympathize. I, it's a very hard moment to learn how to do this. Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, because I love radio and audio so much, I really do value, like, I, I actually feel like content by phone and by Skype and whatever is actually really great. I, I honestly prefer to not see people. Um, when I do interviews, uh, I like better that mode where I'm really just listening and I'm not worrying about whether I have food in my teeth or anything like that. So I like the, I like the distance a little bit, but it is, it's, ve but it is, it's very limiting. Um, you have to work really hard to get people to give you details that you can't even really confirm, which is like, where are you? What are you looking at? What does that feel like? What is that? You, you have to ask so many more questions, I think. Yeah. Um, and really still think, even though you're doing all your things like this, you know, you can get somebody to pick up their phone and they can go to their window and they can walk outside and they can show you their life. So the more you can do that, I think that the better and richer your reporting will be. And good luck guys and stay safe. Great advice. Well, listen, thank you, Amanda. Thank you, Ellen, for this conversation and uh, stay safe and, uh, and uh, let's keep talking. It was fun. It was great to, to not see you all, but to speak with you and hopefully you got something out of this. Thank you very much, Ellen. Thank you very much, Robert. Thanks for the invite. Thanks, Amanda. Appreciate it. Stay safe out there. And you too. All right. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone.